Holy City Center Radio. It is episode 100, and I am your host, Christian Sanger. Today is Friday, March 24th, 2023. Keeping it 100. Can't believe it. They said it couldn't be done. I don't know. No one said that. I mean, maybe someone did, but no. <laughs> it's still uh, pretty incredible to hit episode number 100. Definitely seemed like it was going to take a long time to get there when the podcast first started because, you know, between scheduling and the fact that I was doing one episode a week and sometimes there's cancellations and things, it just felt like, ah, can't get in a groove, but have definitely found the groove here in 2023, this new format, um, having um, the ability to record on my own um, has really helped out a lot and, I, and I'm happy with uh, where we're at with episode 100 still want to get back into doing interviews and I hope to do that soon I keep telling myself today's the day I'm gonna you know make sure all the levels and all, everything's set up to do recordings um, you know interviews over the phone you know from my home and things like that I just never get around to it it's busy busy holding down two jobs uh, and when you continually add work to one actually well both <laughs> continually have work added at both jobs and also trying to maintain some semblance of a uh, a social life or a uh, you know being able to just be lazy if I want to um, so with that balance I know it's been a little delayed uh, but for sure uh, interviews will be coming back assuming you know everything works on a technical level but all of that is to say, very happy with the direction it's going. I've appreciated the feedback. A lot of people, because I'm posting more, Hey, new episode out, new episode out. I'm noticing people like, wait, you have a podcast, (laughs) you know, and when you have a website or, um, you know, whatever your business may be, if you run everything through Instagram, you know, if you're one of those folks, you, you, you sometimes get shocked that, what do you mean? You don't know about X, Y, and Z. I posted about it a million times. You know, it's like every week I'll post like, you know, this week, this show is happening and people are like, oh, I wish I knew about this sooner. And I've been posting about it for months. <laughs> you know, it's just you forget with algorithms and people aren't just sitting wanting to consume every piece of content you put out. Um, you know, so uh, it's been interesting. Like, what do you mean you don't know? I've been posting about this for two years, basically. Uh, so uh, it's definitely helped get more people uh aware of the podcast and I appreciate everyone who's downloaded, who's given it a shot and uh, anybody who's continuing to listen. I really, really appreciate it Uh, to keep it going. uh, You can certainly help out in numerous ways. I talk about it at the end of every episode, but we'll do it now. If you're enjoying the podcast, looking forward to interviews coming back. You don't want to miss any episodes. Be sure, be sure to subscribe to this podcast on whatever platform you use. In addition to that, which helps me, but also helps you make sure you're not missing any episodes. Be sure to like the podcast if that is available on whatever streaming platform you have. Review it if you can. It doesn't have to be a long, crazy review. Just, you know, really enjoyed it. You know, good Charleston podcast. You know, something simple like that. But just having a good review helps, um, you know, boost on all these platforms and increases the chances that people will actually find it and listen. And also, if there's a rating system, if you could do that as well on your platform, that really helps out as well. Other ways to help things, uh, whether it's the podcast, the website, or everything in Holy City Centerland, you can go to patreon.com slash holycitycenter or go to holycitycenter.com slash shop to pick up some merchandise. Um, There's also a link on my site and other ways you can support, you know, people can direct donate if they want to, to help offset some of the costs with producing a podcast or uh, maintaining a website and security and all that kind of stuff. Uh, security on the website, that is. I don't have my own personal security. It's not, it's not that serious over here. Um, those are all great ways to help. But if you can't do all those things, or any of those things, I should say, um, just listening uh, is helpful. Uh, maybe letting someone know about the show. Let's just keep it going. I'm just happy to have more listeners and just want to keep that base growing. And uh, which will, in the end, make the podcast even better. So a big thank you. Episode 100. Really cool to to say that. I can't believe that a 100 of these things are out there in the ether <laughs> on the Internet. Uh, it's wild to think about when you step back and actually think about that. Um, but any in any event, I really appreciate y'all and uh, your support over these 100 episodes. And without any further ado, let's get into the latest topics. That's what you're here for anyway, right? All right, first up, um, 
I often complain about what's going on in the state legislature. It's easy to do that when you have the kind of yahoos we have uh, in the state trying to pass legislation. But every once in a while, something good goes through. And so far, what I know about this next uh, proposal seems to be a pretty good idea. And I'm certainly on board with it. Uh, so um, right now, there is proposed legislation uh, that has kind of a, a different idea. I hadn't heard about this before, even though apparently it's it's going on in other states. But uh, basically, it's a way to try to curb suicides by uh, that are, that uh, um, that happen with the use of a gun by creating a voluntary no cell weapons list. So here's some of the details behind it. You know, when we talk about gun legislation, a lot of the attention is on murders and mass shootings. Makes sense, of course, right? These are horrific situations, events that occur in this country far too frequently, of course. It involves deaths of multiple people. It's scary. It happens in places like schools and churches, which, you know, makes it on some level even more shocking sometimes, especially when it's involving children. And uh, so a lot of attention is paid to those. But there is a lot of people who die from gun violence in other ways. Yeah, there's, you know, one off murders. You know, I say one off in the sense that, you know, maybe there's a road rage incident or a fight or whatever. It's not a mass shooting. It's not a planned thing necessarily. Those are there as well, and they don't get the headlines, but people still know about them. But suicide is another one uh, that a lot of people die as a result of using a gun. To back that up, here are some statistics from the Centers for Disease Control, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. This is from 2020, the most recent data they have. 54% of gun deaths were suicides. So that may be surprising to some of you. I, I didn't realize that of all the gun deaths in this country, the majority of them, 54%, are from suicides. You would think mass shootings or just, you know, quote unquote, run of the mill. It's not really an appropriate way to describe it. But, you know, traditionally, when you think about gun deaths, you're, again, you're thinking about homicides. But no, the majority are from suicide. Uh, and this new bill was introduced back on March 15th in the South Carolina Senate, and then it aims to reduce that figure by creating this voluntary gun do not sell list. So those who struggle with thoughts of suicide, which is often an impulse decision, could place themselves on a list. And if they attempted to try to legally purchase a gun, their name would be flagged during the background check provided, you know, done by the gun stores. So in the sense, just like anybody else, they're not supposed to sell a gun to the name would be flagged and they wouldn't be able to sell the gun. It would also become illegal for the merchant to sell that person on the list of firearms. So if somehow, I don't know if it's going to say why they're on the list or, or what, you know, if someone's like, Oh, so you put yourself on this list a year ago and you said you're feeling fine now. Okay. Well, we'll sell you a gun. You know, they'll be in trouble for that. Now there is a way to remove yourself from the list just so you know. So this isn't like something where if someone is just going through a really rough time, puts himself on the list and through work, therapy, medication, whatever it may be, just is in a much better place down the line, they can remove themselves from the list. So we'll get into that in a second. So the um, person who proposed this bill is Myrtle Beach Republican, uh, State Senator Luke Rankin. Um, and he said that this seems to be a no brainer. This is the one tool to help someone who might have those ideas in their head that they want to harm themselves. And this could protect them in the future if they're like, you know what? There's been a few times where I've been really down and I've thought about, you know, harming myself, killing myself. And it'd be so easy for me to get a gun because I can legally get one. It's so easy to do. I got to make sure I got to protect myself because I'm feeling good right now. But I know if I'm in that dark place again, I, I, I won't be thinking like I am right now. And I want to make sure I'm protected. So, yeah, I, I like I think this makes sense. I like this. So how this would work, individuals who are 18 and older could apply to the list. And it would be maintained by the state law enforcement division, a.k.a. SLED. Uh, what they would do is uh, the, the person would fill out an online form or they could submit it in person if they want to with a photo ID at any law enforcement agency in the state. Actually, let me correct that. Not either or. There's an online form, but you do have to then submit it in person. So in, in the end, you're still going to have to go in person with a photo ID at any law enforcement agency. And then you can be added to that list. 
Any person on the list can apply to remove themselves from the do not sell list the same way, uh, though there would be a 14 day waiting period. So if someone decides I, I trust myself, I'm not worried about harming myself anymore. I want to remove myself from the do not sell list when it comes to guns. They can do so, just have to wait two weeks before it is officially processed. There are actually three other states who have this type of legislation, Washington, Virginia, and Utah. And in those states, it had support from both conservative Republicans as well as progressive Democrats, which we kind of think are the two extremes of each party. So if you can get to two extremes agreeing on something, it must be pretty pretty much a no-brainer that everyone's on board with. And um, from again, from what I'm seeing, it sounds like a great idea. I'm all for this one. I, I haven't thought or heard of any reason this wouldn't be a good idea. So it seems, unless I'm missing something, which is entirely possible, it seems like a good idea. And another reason why this is a good idea, again, we look at some of the statistics. So not only are more than half of all suicides carried out with a gun, about 85% of suicide attempts with a gun are lethal. So not only are people using guns the most when they're trying to kill themselves, it's also 85% effective when they use a gun as the weapon. Now, people who survive other methods, you know, say like an intentional overdose, uh, there's a lot of, according to statistics, the majority of people, or at least a good chunk of them, I should say, survive those methods. So there's a survival rate with the other methods, whereas a gun is more likely to do the job. Another reason why it'd be a good idea to have this list. Additionally, according to the statistics we've been talking about, 90% of people who survive a serious suicide attempt do not go on to die of suicide. So that means someone who you know, may have done something like an intentional overdose, 90% of the people that would survive something like that don't actually go on to die of suicide in their life. Without painting with too broad of a brush, that means those folks regretted the decision, they're thankful that they made it, and don't try it again. Or at least, if they do, they survive that attempt as well, and then end up dying of a different cause. Again, 90% of people who survive a serious suicide attempt do not die from suicide. So again, just a, another reason, you're taking a lethal weapon out of someone's hands that would lower suicide rates, and you'd be doing them a huge service of not putting an, a, a, a weapon that is very effective for ending life, whether your own or someone else's, not allowing them to have it. And again, I don't want to paint with too broad of a brush, but you see a lot of mass shootings, too, where the gunmen end up killing themselves or they get killed by police, which may have been intentional in their plan all along. So if you have someone that isn't on like a do not sell list for any other reason, but maybe is one of those people who wants to die, but for whatever reason decides they want to take other people with them, if they make that decision when they're clear headed and not in the mental in the middle of a mental crisis of some kind to not be allowed to get a gun, you could be potentially protecting other people as well. Seems like a no brainer. Um, and I, I'm, I'm definitely in support of it based on what I'm seeing. So it's a proposal at this point. We'll see where it goes, but you can contact your state legislatures and let them know if you support it or not. Moving on, unfortunately, a, a really horrific, um, sad story that is almost unbelievable sounding. Uh, that this could happen, but unfortunately it has, and we're just getting started with this case. I'm talking about uh, an incident that happened at the Al Cannon Detention Center, a uh, Charleston County coroner on this, uh, mo this past Monday announced that an inmate's cause of death was determined to be from E. coli, specifically E. coli EAEC sepsis. I don't know if that, what that, officially stands for, if I even pronounced it right, I don't know if you're supposed to say the letters or if it's, you know, whatever. But bottom line is, died from e contracting E. coli in some fashion and, and, and ends up dying from that. 
The, the man's name was D'Angelo Brown. He died back on December 29th of 2022 at MUSC. Uh, as I said, the coroner said the cause of, our de- cause of death was from that E. coli sepsis, with, uh, which includes septic shock and multiple organ system failure due to gross medical neglect. So that means, yes, he contracted something horrible, E. coli, but because of gross medical neglect. Now, this is a coroner saying this. This isn't even the investigator. This isn't a family. Uh, This is the coroner saying it. So that basically means that this person, Mr. D'Angelo Brown, could have been treated for this and survived, is is how I'm interpreting it, and that's how his family seems to be interpreting it as well. Um, And the coroner went so far as to say that, that that means that they ruled the death as a homicide. It's weird. I never thought I'd see something like that. Someone is a homicide victim from E. coli, which led to sepsis and multiple organ failure. That's not something you think about when you think of homicide. So this is, and, and because of that ruling, it has made it easy, easier for the family's lawyers to, you know, get the information and get the ball rolling with a lawsuit. And, and unfortunately, the details get worse from there. So before we get into some of the details, we do, or we, I don't know why I say we, I'm the only person doing this. I do have to share um, some statements from the officials. So first statement comes from Charleston County Sheriff Kristen Graziano. Um, This is what she had to say about the coroner's ruling. Uh, Based on the time the coroner dedicated to this case, her ruling on Mr. Brown's death did not surprise me. SLED is investigating the possible criminal aspect of the case, and the sheriff's office has been cooperating. Meanwhile, our own internal investigation remains underway. I have full confidence in my detention staff that cons- that concerns over Mr. Brown's medical treatment and his needs were documented and referrals were made. We are continuing to work with the county through the procurement process to find a different health care provider. End quote. Uh, Charleston County Sheriff's Office released their own statement saying, quote, every detention center resident has a right to adequate medical care. While our staff cannot provide it directly, we are committed to providing access to quality care. We will continue to work with the on-site medical contractor in Charleston County to address concerns about the quality of care provided at the facility. With the current contract, Charleston County and WellPath set to expire in June, Charleston County began accepting bids from prospective providers in December, end quote. So putting it all into perspective, the sheriffs, of course, are not medically trained. I'm, you know, I'm sure they have some basic uh, training as far as to try to stabilize people in common situations, um, you know, wound dressing, Heimlich maneuver, you know, whatever it may be until the medical staff can fully arrive. They contracted out to this company called WellPath, and that is who, if they see um, an inmate having any kind of issues uh, medically, that's who they refer them to, and and then WellPath, you know, examines the inmate and then goes from there. So that's that's what we're looking at. Now, more than two hundred pages of documents from the Alcana Detention Center are have are now out. The family and their lawyers have it. Media has been able to get a hold of it, and we're learning more and more about the the months that led up to the death of Mr. Brown, who, by the way, was uh, just 28 years old. So he had spent five months in uh, at Al Cannon before he was transferred to MUSC, where he passed. Um, based on those that paperwork, here are some of the. I'm saying highlights, but I mean obviously this is not highlights in the sense of good. Uh, but by September, there was a noticeable noticeable shift in his activity as staff started to report he was getting more aggressive and was having more erratic behavior. Um, an entry on September 6th was the first that mentioned uh, that his cell was filled with water, urine, and feces. And it was the first of several that ended up documenting that. He lived in those conditions for days, and the report did not indicate if it was actually ever cleaned or not. So there's, it's unsure of when on September 6th, when they mentioned the condition of his cell, that it was cleaned ever or, or when it was finally. On uh, A September 10th entry showed that Brown had been placed on a mental health watch. Documentation then appeared to show that he was observed for several days before being returned to his cell. Then on September 29th, the report indicated that he was placed in an emergency restraint chair for about two hours, but the report did not say why that was. 
Moving forward, on November 6th, an entry included comments from staff that stated his cell was being sanitized and cleaned after being, quote, heavily soiled with feces, end quote. This issue continued for months until December 21st, when Brown was found in his cell breathing but unresponsive. So this behavior just kept repeating where, you know, his cell was apparently soiled heavily and had to be cleaned. As I mentioned, once he was found unresponsive, he was brought to MUSC and he died just over a week later. Based on these reports, his family has filed a wrongful death lawsuit against the county and the sheriff's office. Lawyers who are representing the family claim there were multiple missed opportunities to interfere by detention staff and that Brown's death was 100 percent preventable. Uh, the lawyers are from the Evans Moore law firm, and they filed a lawsuit earlier this month. Uh, no less than a dozen times, his lawyer said in cart, uh, court documents that Brown's body and surroundings were covered in his own excrement. The lawsuit alleges he was denied medication to treat his mental health issues, which obviously would explain why this behavior was repeating over and over again. Um, and one of the lawyers said that this wasn't just tragic the way that he died, which of course it was, but now the family also has to know how he lived and for how long during those last few months of his life. The attorneys say the family hopes that changes will be made to prevent something like this from ever happening again. That includes finding a different medical provider, getting rid of that well path um, organization. Um, so some background on that. The county signed an agreement with WellPath in the middle of the pandemic. There was a state of emergency, of course, and that empowered Charleston County Administrator Bill Tootin with the authority to sign off on the initial contract back in May, uh, on May 27th of 2020. A previous Live 5 News investigation revealed by that point in time, the company had already been facing several lawsuits and had, blamed, had been blamed for at least 70 inmate deaths. So... They sign a contract that normally would have had to go through some different steps, but because of the state of the emergency, some of those steps were skipped. But even at the time, local news was able to find out that this company was facing many lawsuits and 70 inmates had died. And now who, I don't know out of how many of those they were found to be at fault, but nonetheless, 70 that they potentially were responsible for the deaths of. Okay, maybe you can excuse away making a mistake during a pandemic, but the contract was renewed four additional times, all of which were signed off by Charleston County Procurement Director Barrett Tolbert. And during that first renewal, the services were even expanded to include psychiatric care. So they re-signed with this company four times and even on the first renewal said, hey, let's add psychiatric care to this. According to the contract, the county has the right to terminate the contract early if that would be in the best interests for the county. And there would be, you know, no detriment, you know, no fees or anything like that. So I'm it's blowing my mind right now learning this whole case, first of all. But the fact that they were aware of the problems with this company, still renewed with them, and now that they're having this very clear, very horrific death on their hands, they still haven't terminated this contract. <laughs> They're still trying to accept bids. I know there's a process, and if they terminate this contract with nobody to back it up, that means there's no care. So I, I get there has to be some unfortunate overlap while they try to find someone. But, man, they really need to hurry up. This is horrific and unex it's inexcusable. To make it even sadder, uh, the lawyers for the family have said that this problem actually goes beyond one company. And in, in their opinion, it's this newer system of contract and medical providers and government run facilities that's really the problem. And I've heard stories like that before that these contracted things and government run facilities tend to lead to a lot of problems. So, as if this wasn't sad and scary enough that this could happen to anybody who is incarcerated in this state or this, at least this area, uh, it might not matter where you live because you might have one of these other contracted medical providers which are coming under similar fire. So sad, horrific story. Hope the family gets some kind of justice. It seems pretty clear from, from the coroner's report to the, the documentation that steps were missed and this person and his family now have to deal with those decisions and and most tragically d'angelo brown lost his life 
and which could have been seemed to be to me not an expert but to me <laughs> and also the coroner and the lawyers that this was 100% preventable i'll be sure to keep you updated on any developments in that case lastly uh just so we can close out with a different story North Charleston Mayor Keith Summey told News 2 on Thursday morning that Chief Police Chief Reggie Burris will resign in May. Burgess um, actually just marked five years as the department's leader this past January. He was named police chief in 2018. Uh, he took over for Eddie Driggers um, when he became special assistant to the mayor. A native of North Charleston, Burgess grew up in Union Heights and Liberty Hill, two historical neighborhoods. He then graduated um, from Bonds Wilson slash North Charleston High School in 1984 and went on to attend Morgan State University in Baltimore. His resignation has ramped up speculation that he may be running for mayor of North Charleston. You may remember Key Summy announced he will not be running again um, and basically stopped short of fully endorsing Burgess for the position, even though Burgess hadn't announced anything yet. Uh, but uh, Police Chief Burgess did recently hint at a possible run for mayor uh, during an interview with News 2 earlier this year. So there, obviously the speculation is ramping up since he put in his resignation. Uh, back then, when he was talking to News 2, he said he would consider to run uh, for mayor if Kisami did not seek re-election. That's, of course, what happened. You heard, as I said, Sami basically endorsed him, and now he's resigning. So it seems pretty clearly... Uh, that Reggie Burris will be running for mayor of North Charleston, but it is not official. Things could always change, and who knows? But the, don't be shocked if that's what comes down the pike here. That'll do it for Holy City Center Radio. I hope you all have a great weekend. Um, have fun. Stay safe. I can't wait to speak to you all on Monday. Until then, good night and good luck. <laughs>